Hello everyone, today I wanted to talk about a 1935 comedy called The Bride Comes Home, starring Claudia Colbert, Fred McMurray, Robert Young. This is the second of two Keenan Lorber uh, releases uh, last week of, of Colbert and, and Fred McMurray. Um, and I did uh, The Gilda Lily about three videos back and and um, in between uh, The Gilded Lily and The Bride Comes Back, I spent three days uh, watching Mirror, the Andre Tarkovsky movie, which is a very brooding, a very gloomy kind of experience. Uh, uh, and don't get me wrong, I think it's a great movie, but, uh, but let's say Tarkovsky doesn't exactly have a sense of humor. <laughs> uh, and I thought, I, I do have a sense of humor. I thought I, would, I got a kind of perverse chuckle that I would... Uh, um, book, bookend uh, the mirror with two Kodak Colbert comedies from the 1930s, uh, fluffy, breezy, of real no import. But for some reason, I, almost 90 years later, they're still very, very interesting. And um, and I, I came across that quote from Tarkovsky. I don't mean to dump on him because I just made a video which, where I praised him, but. Uh, as regards to entertainment, the kind of entertainment that Colbert uh, represents in these two movies. And uh, Tarkovsky is, <clears throat> excuse me, talking about Mirror, and the quote goes, there are no entertaining moments in the film. In fact, I am categorically against entertainment in cinema. It is as degrading for the author as it is for the audience. Now, that's some pretty heavy stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, I mean, Shakespeare was entertaining. <laughs> and even within the Russian context, um, Tolstoy wrote entertainments. And maybe Anna Karenina and, and uh, War and Peace are full of entertaining <laughs> sequences. Uh, Pushkin, who is referenced in Mirror, is also very funny. And Dostoevsky is hilarious. Believe me, he, he really is. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it, yeah, it, it, it kind of points up perhaps a limitation in Tarkovsky's art, um, his, his view of life. Uh, it's, it's more towards Solzhenitsyn. I remember when Solzhenitsyn came to the U.S. as a defector, uh, you look you look like he came out of a, a Old Testament, uh, uh, you know, prophet coming out of the Old Testament, and never smiled in his life. But enough of dumping on Tarkovsky. But um, these these. Two Claire Colbert uh, uh, movies, if nothing else, they, they did cleanse the palate that I don't think there's anything wrong with entertainment. and But they're interesting in a lot of other ways. Um, certainly, we get uh, terrific actors. We also get um, we also get sort of a mirror itself, a mirror a reflection of what life was like in the Depression. Certainly, these are... Um, these are uh, inconsequential. Uh, they're not meant to be movies that are going to change your life. Uh, but 90 years later, they still look pretty good. And um, Clodic, this was the Gilded Lily. And as you can see in the Gilded Lily, Fred McMurray's down the bottom of the sharing uh, second row with uh, Ray Milan. And <clears throat> in this movie, released the same year, 1935, he's up at the top, right underneath uh, Clodic Colbert. And um, uh, Gilded Lily was released in January. The Bride comes across in December. In the meantime, Mc, uh, Fred Murray had become a big star, very he, immediately popular. So on the title page of the Paramount uh, uh, release of The Bride Comes Home, Claudette Col and they used to do Paramount used to do these titles where um, where the uh, you had an actor, everything was on one page. You had the actor at the top, you had the director in the middle, and that down the bottom you had the, um, the, the, in this case, the leading men, because McMurray is not, at the, by the time the movie was released. Um, his, his, uh, he had been promoted from the actual uh, title uh, page to, to the top, and he deserves it because it's, he, he gives a terrific performance. and. It's another triangle, just like the Gilded Lily. I, I, I found this triangle to be, romantic triangle, to be a little bit more interesting, basically because the Robert Young character is a little bit more interesting than the Ray Milan character, who I thought was a little bit underwritten in the Gilded Lily. Uh, Claudia Colbert's father had lost most of his money in the Wall Street uh, collapse, 
and now he's told her I, everything that was left is now gone. She has to go out and get a job. Her boyhood, her girlhood, uh, childhood uh, friend was Robert Young, uh, who also came. Both of them were brought up in riches. Um, and Robert Young has been in love with Claudette Colbert from the time of childhood and encourages her to marry him, financial security. Uh, he, uh, Robert Young has now come into his money, which if, uh, the film states is three and a half million dollars. I looked it up. Three and a half million dollars, 1935 is about 70 million dollars today. So considerable amount of money. He starts a magazine, his bodyguard, who he always fights with, but has a, develops a friendship for Robert Young, a friendship for Fred McMurray, decide, hears of this dream that he has. So he opens up uh, a magazine, puts Fred McMahon, uh, McMurray as the editor of the magazine. This is his dream. And then he hires his girl, when he learns his girlfriend, Claudette Colbert, needs a job, he hires her as Fred McMurray's assistant. Well, it was like, it's like, uh, uh, they, they commence battle almost immediately, uh, and they battle well. I mean, this is uh, Claudia Colbert's uh, strength, uh, her uh, resilience, her, uh, uh, it, it, she can stand up to anybody. Um, uh, she's very intelligent, and she, she, she certainly um, brings all that to this role. And, uh, it, but of course, when, they, when people fight, they're, they're actually, uh, attracted to each other. I, I'm recalling a line from <clears throat> bringing a baby recently out on Blu-ray where Catherine Hepburn is being, she thinks, is being followed by Cary Grant and they're always fighting. She comes across a psychiatrist. She asks him a question, why, you know, what, what, what's, why is this guy following around? All he wants to do is fight with me. And the psychiatrist, the uh, famous line the psychiatrist has, the love impulse in man frequently reveals itself in terms of conflict. And uh, so we got a lot of conflict in this. And then there is the dilemma, who do I marry? You know, do I marry money? Do I marry love, passion? You know, you always, in the back of your mind, you're always thinking, you know, five years from now, the money might look pretty good, but the passion might fade. <laughs> but in the, in the context of the romantic comedy of the 1930s, um, you know, it's uh, it, it, passion, love, true love, uh, you know, is is uh, is is, uh, is a, a formidable opponent to a lifetime of financial security. And so, uh, Colbert was was a very busy actress. I, I I have to just recite a few of the movies in the 1935. Now, as I said, Gilbert Lily came out in January. Bride Comes Home. Home came out in uh, in December. In between that, she married she she made Private Worlds, and she married her boss. One that one is a drama, Private Worlds, and, and Colbert was uh, you know very as adept at drama as she was in uh, in comedy, and um, both uh, directed by Gregory and Kyla. I've not seen either of them. And in the year before, she made four movies. Imitation of Life, some people think that's her best performance. Cleopatra for Cecil B. DeMille. And It Happened One Night, her big uh, Oscar-winning uh, performance. And, and with uh, Fred McMurray, between January and December, he made four movies, including Alice Adams with Katherine Hepburn and directed by George Stevens and also Hands Across the Table. Uh, Mitchell Lyson in the comedy with uh, Carol Lombard. I think that's the first of a few Carol Lombard uh, matchups that McMurray had. I also want to mention the um, some of the supporting players. The uh, the father of uh, of uh, Claudia Colbert uh, is uh, played by William Collier, and he's very old, but uh, he he's just it's, it's amazing how uh, these studios would. Uh, were able to take every supporting player and give them, you know, a, a indelible moments, and um, and also, and he he advises Fred McMurray comes to him for for help when he needs all of his money, and he's willing to help Fred McMurray in his cause with his daughter's affections, and um, and there's two others, Donald Meek, uh, if ever a character actor was named properly, it had to be Donald Meek, who's a mousy. Kind of cowering uh, looking fellow and 
he plays the uh, a judge who's come to marry. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't come off, but he comes to marry McMurray and and Colbert, and but there's all kind of fighting going on. Uh, they just can't seem to pause uh, <laughs> the fighting long enough to get married, and and Meek actually stands up to McMurray. You know, and they get on with the gifts. You, you got to stop doing this, and it's a moment you don't often see with Meek. And then, but then he just goes back to his cowering ways when McMurray's fury is. is he's no match for McMur McMurray's fury. And then there's Edgar Kennedy. Kennedy, Edgar Kennedy was also always known as the slow burn. He was in Keys he was in Max Senate movies, Chaplin movies, um, uh, Marx Brothers movies, uh, Laurel and Hardy. Uh, but he, he was a really good, in, in which he was the slow burn uh, kind of comic foil, but he was a really good supporting player. And he's got one of his, 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 his uh, best uh, little performances here. He's not, he doesn't get a lot of screen time. Uh, there's another movie that he made, I think it might have been his last movie, because I think he died in the late 40s. So it's Unfaithful Faithfully Years with Preston Sturgis, where he plays a private detective. And um, he is, uh, he's, um, he has been hired to uh, trail uh, Rex Harrison's uh, wife, and he finds, uh, unbeknownst to Rex Harrison, and he finds evidence that sort of points to his wife being you know, unfaithful. And Rex Harrison says, who hired you? And he runs to, to uh, the office where Edgar Kennedy is. And Rex Harrison is his famous composer, and, he, and Harrison is taken back because uh, Edgar Kennedy idolizes him. And uh, you know, as a compo as a conductor, he's not a composer; he's a conductor. And and uh, he he mentions concerts that he's seen with him, and he, he a hand Handel concert, and he has this famous line where uh, Kennedy tells him, "No one handles Handel like you handle Handel." And I, I'm only making all these connections because I think it's it's part of the charm, part of the the element of old Hollywood films, uh, where you see all these supporting roles, uh, actors, and and this is Hollywood cinema was an actor's cinema. There were great directors, great writers, but the focus was always on the actors, and and it didn't it wasn't just the stars, but uh, you know uh, the secondary uh, players. Uh, Always, they, they would have you know write a part for write a small part for Edgar Kennedy, write a small part for Donald Meek. What uh, one, one presumes that was so. So, anyways, this bride comes home. As I said, uh, after uh, Mirror, it was uh, it, it would have been a lot of fun. Anyways, uh, uh, it, it was a good time. All right, thanks a lot for everybody who stuck with me. I appreciate it as always. Comments are welcome. You guys take care. Catch you next time.